Hello, listeners. I'm Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator, bringing you this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? A series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, in transition, or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to people who are established in their careers so that they might find a new way forward. Today, I'm excited to be interviewing Adam Kemper, who is in sales. He's the client acquisition manager at Plum Marketing. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Kathy. Glad to be here. And Adam and I met through a mutual friend at the Colorado Thought Leaders Forum, which has been such a great group to connect and meet such wonderful career-focused people. So uh, again, I thank you for being willing to be on my show. Absolutely. I, it was great meeting you at the uh, Colorado Thought Leaders Forum. And uh, as you said, always a great place to meet great, interesting, uh, forward-thinking people. So Adam, I, I'd like to start out before we get into what your career is and how you got there. I always like to start with my icebreaker questions because it really brings a personal aspect to the program. So if you wouldn't mind telling us where you grew up, how many siblings you grew up with and where you are in the birth order. And I know that's a lot of questions, but um, and then how how do you think all of that influenced you? Uh, I'm a Colorado native, grew up, born and raised in Aurora, Colorado. Uh, I am the youngest of two. I have one older brother. Um, my mom was an elementary school playground lady, and my dad worked for Gates Rubber Company here in Colorado. Um, and I think, I think being the youngest, uh, the little brother, uh, really was kind of what set me on the path to be able to be a successful salesperson. I spent a lot of my youth trying to make my brother's friends like me. And oh, you, can't, you can't really force that. You have to finesse that. Um, and I learned that very early on that I, I was more successful at making my brother's friends like me when I did it through finesse rather than force. So it, it almost bothered my brother more when his friends would ask me to come along. And so the better I did at that, the more it bothered my brother, too. So it was all part of the psychology of trying to figure out how to get people to like me. And in sales, there's a lot of that same psychology of just trying to get to understand what people want and how they're going to like you enough to buy from you. So, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. It's funny. I've, I've, I've not heard that um, described in that way about the youngest. And I love that, that, that I wanted to finesse versus force. Cause I do think the youngest, a lot of times is in that mode of either mom and dad says, Oh, you got to take the youngest with you or, you know, you always want to be invited, but there isn't the invitation. So, wow, I, very cool. I very early on learned that getting forced didn't feel very good for me. I always felt like, you know, yeah, I'm there, but, and I wanted to be there without the but. So I had to figure out how to finesse it better. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be there because they want me here, not because it was forced to be here. Exactly. So. Okay. Well, hey, another Colorado native. I'm a Colorado native. Um, so Aurora, Colorado, what, uh, uh, what did you say the age difference was between you and your brother? Two years. Two years. Okay. So did you, um, that's probably where you're close enough at some point you overlap with sports or activities. Uh, what, what did you guys do for fun? Uh, our thing was Boy Scouts and I actually got involved first and my brother joined about six months later and, um, being a, a big personality as he was, he kind of took over and I realized that, that uh, this was a place I wanted to be and I wanted to be accepted. So I had to figure out how to do it on my own terms. Oh, so you're there first and he comes along. Yeah. Wow. That's got to be a, a tough, tough situation. Well, you know, we, we both found our own way. I, I look back at my time in scouts still with such reverence. I was a scout boy scout counselor at a peaceful Valley scout ranch out East of Colorado for four summers and my brother chose a different path inside of scouts and led inside the troop but we both found our place and were able to find our voices and figure out who we were as people wow so that um that troop actually then or that troop experience was a big part of your life absolutely uh, scouts was formative for me great any sports or musical instruments uh i was a runner but running is sort of a solitary sport that uh uh, you, you know, you don't depend on anybody else. There's not really a team strategy so much as, um, you know, you support the strongest runner and you just try to get there fastest. 
So <laughs> I was a cross country runner. So oh, that's, that's, that's more just of just the endurance sport. Yeah. I don't know how you did that. I was a sprinter. So uh, yeah, the cross country thing. I'm like, that's what they make cars for, you know, to go that distance. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I loved it because it was, it was almost meditative for me. Ah, ah, totally get that. Yeah. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit here. Uh, on a scale of one to five, where do you put yourself on the fun meter? One being the couch <laughs> potato and five being life of the party. I'm a 10. <laughs> a 10? Oh, you're on the scale. No, no, I, I believe that, that life is way too short to be lived in, in an unenjoyable way. So uh, I'm a giant child and, and my children sometimes don't love that, but uh, they always enjoy it on some level. They just won't always admit it. <laughs> <laughs> they'll admire it later in life when you're young at heart that's right i'm not i'm not afraid to make a fool of myself for the laughter of others <laughs> <laughs> well awesome that's going to explain a lot as we go through this uh through this story today okay so let's shift gears on the risk taking meter same scale one to five where are you on taking risks as surprising as it sounds i i'd actually give myself about a four i believe that sometimes i uh I overanalyze certain things. And when I think about how it's going to affect others, if it's just me, I'll leap. But if it's going to affect others, I probably worry too much. Mm. I think about So when you became a dad, things might have changed. Well, it's it's it goes back to the little brother syndrome. It's it, always thinking about how things affect others as a primary function of, of my thoughts. So, um, you know, if it's just going to affect me or has a positive all around, that's great. But if you know, that's one of the things I've always struggled with in leadership. If somebody has to be let go from a team, I'm not well built to handle that. Even if it's a weak link, I, I still have the desire to help rather than be what sometimes do what's necessary. So my next phase of my career is really moving into a leadership phase because I have to learn to take risks on behalf of others and trust that I can serve them well still. Mm hmm. Okay, very thoughtful there. Well, thank you for sharing that piece. Again, both of these questions, I think the fun and the risk do play into uh, how you made decisions throughout your career. So let's, let's kind of get into your story then. Tell us a little bit about what your role is today, and then we'll get into how did you get there? Sure. So with Plum Marketing, uh, we are a marketing agency specializing in print and direct mail. Um, but really what we are is a marketing agency specializing in helping customers understand their customers better. Um, mm -hmm. I get to work with the empathy muscle very heavily and sit down with businesses and ask them who they talk to, what they say to them, and then ask them that pivotal question. Why does your customer care about what you do and what you say to them? Uh, so often in a business, we know the nuts and bolts, the features and benefits of what we do, but we don't understand the value from the everyday, what have you done for me to make my life better place that people buy from. Um, so whether it's landscaping services or medical services or any number of things that, that are offered out in the world of, of businesses I serve, it's about helping them to flex that thought process and say, who do we serve? And when we, they say, thank you for dot, 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 they don't say thank you for providing me a high quality product in a great amount of time. They say, thank you for making my life better. Mm -hmm. And how do we then say, we serve by making your life better in this way? Instead of saying, here are our tactical ins and outs. We go straight to with our customers to let's find out what you do to make people's lives better and then go tell other people, this is what we do to make people's lives better. Can we do it for you too? So you really get, you get them as well as yourself out of that. You're just selling a product that it's really, how, how do you make your clients lives better and how do they make their clients lives better? Like exactly. That. And that allows us to provide a, uh, a service that sometimes ends in a sale and sometimes ends in just serving them by giving them better perspective. Yeah. Getting them to think about the, the what, how they're serving others versus how they're right. selling Right. I mean, we've, we've had meetings with marketing teams where one of the team members ended up no longer participating in the project because they didn't have buy-in and the conversation made it clear to everybody else. They didn't have buy-in. 
they bought into other areas of the organization, but this project, they weren't on board. So we just had them assigned elsewhere because the rest of the organization was, and they weren't serving well. So even in that, it allows us to help our clients be aligned properly. Mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds like based on what you said about being the younger brother and how you look at life and the impact of others, uh, this sounds like a really good fit. Absolutely. I love the ability to do, to do just this. And it's, you know, it, it also allows through difficult times like the current situation with COVID to be able to talk to businesses and say, hey, this isn't profiteering. This isn't taking advantage of. You do something to serve people in this environment. Let's help you articulate it because there's a need. And if you serve a need, then let's make sure people know you exist. That's not that's not a, a moral issue. So we're even seeing in this time the, the ability for people to feel more confident when they are able to succeed in down times. Yeah, and it's serving others. So, so we've talked a little bit about what you're doing, and we'll spend a little bit more time at this um, at, toward the end of the interview. But I got to ask, you know, how did I get here? When you were in uh, junior high and high school, were you thinking marketing, sales <laughs> was a path you wanted to get in? Or what did you want to be when you An adult? And with all of the freedom and benefits thereof, but no idea how I was going to earn any money. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I got a degree in history, government, pre-law. Because I wow, that's heavy. I that's loved heavy. history. I love debating. I love that part of my mind being uh, are developed. But at the same time, I had no idea what I was going to be when I left college and the path I'd started getting an idea of, which was going to be law school. Uh, I had a very dear professor who I, I valued his opinion greatly, who told me, your minor in finance is ruining you. You're going to be too analytical. They're going to put you in an office and you're never going to see a trial. You're not going to be a lawyer like that. And I went, oh, that's not what I want to get into it for. That's a lot of debt to sit in a cubicle. So, yeah. so rather than go to law school, I graduated with no plan, no idea what I wanted to be. And the only reason I had a job is because they had a job fair in the college center. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and so what what was that first enterprise job? rent a car so they i don't know if you're familiar but they have a very well-known en- uh, management training program i do know in fact one of my other interviewers interviewees uh that's where he started as well and he he remarked very positively on their training and onboarding and management. Yeah, they program. are well known for having a, a very strong management training program that takes about a year to complete. And once you complete it, there's a backlog to get promotions because it is a good company, but there's a limit to what they, you know, how many locations they can open. Oh, yeah. So at 11 mm-hmm. months, I completed my management training program and, um, You know, I didn't know what I was going to do next. And uh, a family member said, I have a, a, somebody works over at Nextel Communications and they can get you a job in their corporate collections division because you have management training now and you have a finance minor, so they'll hire you. And uh, I started calling on Universal Studios to get them to pay for cell phones they used on movie shoots. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I, you know, I knew what movies were about to come out because they'd wrap shooting and then I'd bill for the, for the cell phones that they had all issued to all of their celebrities who were acting in the movie. Yeah. Interesting. So I, I did that for about a year and I didn't love it at any point. It was a job that paid the bills. A job. Mm-hmm. I actually really enjoyed Enterprise, but with no future, there was really no option. I wasn't going to rent cars in a suit for the rest of my life. So, yeah, so you, you had to start making some choices. Exactly. On, so leaving this was good training, you know, it'd be good opportunity. But if there wasn't really a spot for you, then right. what do you do? So at that point, it was somebody offered me a job. I, I interviewed. It took no effort. I took the job. I hated the job, but it paid well. And it was what I was supposed to do. <laughs> at that, at time. that time. So I was yeah. uh, my wife and I went on a vacation in August of 2001 to Washington, D.C. to visit a dear friend of ours who lived and worked in, uh, in the Pentagon. And it was uh, two weeks before 
and we did our week long mm-hmm. vacation there and, and had a great time. And I came back from vacation and the next hell office building was secured in a way that was not normal. And I went in through the front entrance and was pulled into a side room and told, we announced that we were uh, outsourcing all the jobs to a third party company and laying everybody off last week while you were on vacation. That's why the building's locked up. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I came back from vacation wow. to find out I had a month and a severance check waiting for me. But mm. the way they played that was they strung it out and they kept moving the severance date so that they never had to pay the severance. And uh, I went and got another job. A buddy of mine who didn't even have a college degree, just a high school diploma, had gotten hired at Oppenheimer Funds. And they had paid him to go through the licensing training to get his Series 6 license and take phone calls. And he says to me, if I can do it without a, high, without a college degree, you college boy, you could do it. So, you can so do it, I, yeah. again, because I knew somebody and he gave me the name of the person to go interview with and I followed their process and they hired me and they trained me and I got my securities license and I became a, 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 a first a, a frontline securities phone call taker and I uh, started a, a week after 9-11 and yeah oh, that was really strange well but but good that you had a job right that quickly. well I was in training on 9-11 and uh, mm. Oppenheimer oh. Funds actually had the location in the Twin Towers. All of the employees, thank God, made it out safely. But the infrastructure was lost, obviously. So Denver took on added importance. And the offices here, they hired a bunch of people right away. So my hiring went from in a couple weeks to can you start tomorrow? And they got mm. me trained quickly, got me licensed quickly, and I spent the next uh, eight and a half years in different roles, working my way up the corporate ladder of Oppenheimer Funds and Mass Mutual. Um, did a lot of things that I don't look back on fondly. Uh, it was a very soul-sucking job. It was a very dark time for morals and ethics. I was part of a group that did high-frequency trading. Um, And we manipulated stock prices because our bosses told us what they were supposed to be at. And we made them do that. And it was completely legal. And I just did my job because I was a 20 year old dude who didn't know any better. Thought you just sucked it up as a young guy in the world and, and hated your job again, just miserable. And, uh, then the great recession happened. And my company lost a whole lot of money that wasn't theirs. And I helped write out the proposals. It was a 529 program. And we had multiple states on our 529. And they lost 80% of their value in the stable value portfolio that's not supposed to lose money. And it was because they had packed it with mortgage securities that they shouldn't have. And the state sued and the SEC had hearings. And people had to testify, including myself, and 300 people were laid off. And during that time, my wife was pregnant, my son had cancer, and I was attempting to file for FMLA, but they were giving me a hard time, and then they laid me off. So while I could have taken legal action, you know, you don't have a job, there's a great recession, you have a sick kid. I was lucky enough to find a job in three weeks with Scott Trade. And did that for a couple years until the recession passed and my son was better. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a lot of, um, that's a lot of life stuff in a very short. And I look at that as chapter one, the dark days, because all of that was teaching me some very valuable lessons because I had to do things. I did things because I thought I had to do things. I, you know, you know, the path you think you're supposed to take. You heard a lot of that in there. And that was that chapter of my career. That was the, I have to chapter. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. What, what would have been your choice while you were working at Oppenheimer? I mean, did, I mean, what were some other options? Were there other people, you know, raising flags and saying, this isn't uh, ethical? Um, did, did you have any role models of that sense or it was really just, you know, head down kind of. I mean, fuck it up? I wrote an email that got me in massive amounts of trouble because I was supposed to calculate these mortgage security, uh, the, uh, the, the ratings 
And the ratings I was calculating were vastly different than the ratings they were coming in with. And I didn't understand why. So I did the math longhand and uh, that was a problem. And that's part of the reason I ended up in that SEC hearing is because every email you send on Wall Street is retained and kept on record. Oh, so they, there was a record of, of you bringing in this to the forefront and then obviously something was done. With I, that I was addressed in person about it and told never to send something like that in an email ever again if I valued my job. So. Ah, okay. So more indications, just keep my head down right. to keep I my mean, job. Uh, as a 20 something year old with a young family, I think there's a certain naivete that people have about what you have to tolerate in a job. At least there was in Gen X. We watched our parents suck yeah. it up. Oh, yeah. yeah. So weren't we supposed to, too? <laughs> well, and you look at even your own personal experience of, you know, you, you had other jobs, you had been laid off before, and then you're in this mode of, well, I need this right. job. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, tough, tough, tough spot, spot to be in. So, so that's chapter one. You call yeah. it what the dark ages? <laughs> so do we have uh do we have the the light ages coming up yeah. next or what's how did you so, transition uh, you heard me mention briefly my son is a cancer survivor and at, at a very young at, age at 13 it months like. he was diagnosed with a blood cancer that is a, a, a le- cousin of leukemia um and it's called histiocytosis and uh his treatment took 23 months so during that wow. time, I lost my job at Oppenheimer. I came over to Scott Trade. They gave me a great opportunity to stabilize my family again and to just get through. Didn't love the job, mm-hmm. but they were good people and they treated me very kindly. Um, and at the end of, of the 23 months of treatment, I had witnessed people who had worked harder than I have ever worked in my career. And they didn't look tired. They didn't look, they looked physically tired, but mentally and emotionally, what they were doing fed them. These doctors, these nurses, these healthcare workers, these social workers, these people who found their passion in helping others and earned a living doing it. And I said, Mm. damn, I feel shame. I have screwed people over for a living for 10 years. I have been a part of the worst era of Wall Street in decades. And I've been a party to these things. And and I don't have to. So when Scott Trade said to me, we would love you to move to St. Louis, Missouri. I said, I would love to not to. (laughs) They said, well, we're going to have to give you a severance check then. And I said, God bless you. Thank you so much. And they looked rather confused because it, my son had recovered from his treatment and he was healthy and we were blessed with that miracle. And it was time for me to make a change. I, I was aware that, that God, whatever you want to call it, was in my life telling me it's time. Be done. So I quit my job at Scott Trade with a severance check and a thank you for your time. And I spent seven months unemployed. I spent the first four of it just at home in what I look at as recovery. I took my kids out of daycare and I played dad and I got better. And then I went job searching with a very different heart and a very different mind. Yeah. But you really needed that time to be compressed, didn't you? And to reevaluate and get back Absolutely. To and, you know, the, the, the thing is, people sometimes feel this shame of accepting unemployment. Don't. If you have wounds, take a minute. Take a knee. In military, when they're in the midst of battle and things aren't going right, they find cover, they take a knee, they readjust the plan. Do the same thing. Take the unemployment, take a knee, get it figured out. Be happy first. Because what you do for a living shouldn't end your living. (laughs) And I can tell you, that first 10 years of my career, I I couldn't see myself as a 60-year-old man if that was my life. It was terrible. Mm. And and I went home miserable every day. I hated my life. my, My family and friends became less willing to tolerate me because of my 
and impatience and intolerance towards life. So it became very challenging. And so, yeah, when, when I, when I sat at home for the first period of it, it was just recovery. So what are some of the things you did uh, when you were in this recovery stage? Cause this is, I think how helpful for other people who might be stuck or looking for work and it can be um, frustrating. I remember when, when I got laid off, I did take a period of time and it was about four months to say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to play. I did have a severance package. And so I, that I did have the, I didn't have that financial pressure right away, but I'd been working for, well, almost 30 years straight at that point. And I'm like, man, I have never had this kind of a break before. I just need to decompress. So I ended up just playing, but it happened to be summer. And so I was golfing mm-hmm. and, um, it was, I remember just, uh, it was a lot of fun. And then I got serious about now I need to look for a job, but some people might be in that mindset of, well, I'm already, I already decompressed or maybe I didn't. So maybe I need to do that. Or they might be in that I'm looking and I need a job. So how do I, how do well, I, yeah. And I, right? I agree. I, I decompressed and I played first. And once I was able to have the mental space to ask some questions for the first time, I hadn't asked in a long time, like, what makes me happy? What do I like? What is fun? What could I see myself enjoying? I didn't necessarily have the answers, but I was also asking questions that were new questions to me that felt like the right questions. Yeah. Well, I love those questions, Adam, because I, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking some of my mindset was, what am I qualified for? What jobs are out there? You know, I mean, you get stuck in that cycle and that's very different than the questions you were asking, which are the questions you're asking are a lot more empowering and more powerful about how to move forward versus what, you know, what mindset you have about, well, what's out there. What Absolutely. You know, that decompression process like that. came with a, with a, a re-embracing of my value because in the corporate world, as blanket as this statement sounds, I will stand behind it. In the corporate world, there are so many people who have lost their identity of who they are and what they're good at because they've been pigeonholed into a job and beaten down by a management who tells them they're barely adequate at it and they don't know their skill set. And when they become unemployed, especially when the last Great Recession was, I saw this, you see people going, I don't understand what my skills are. You've done something for 30 years at an amazing level and you can't see how that fits anywhere else. That's mental abuse that's been perpetrated on you. That's not a lack of skills. So I also had to get past some of those things that put me as my own abuser. Where do I fit into your box is just reoffending. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I found mm-hmm. a lot of things. I was my own jailer in a lot of those mental jails. So I just had to take the time to not be aligned with how they thought and say, no, that's, that's not me. I can't do that. So I'm not going to put myself anywhere that would measure me that way. That's an automatic disqualifier because I won't fit your world. And I became better at knowing what questions to ask myself and then to ask them. And it didn't lead to some epiphany of, oh, I can do this. I just started going to job fairs and I took a folio and a pen and a paper and I'd sit down at an empty table after I did a round and I'd say, okay, there's a company that does this. What is that about? I could do that. That sounds interesting. Ooh, that sounds terrible. No, I don't want to do that. (laughs) And I literally just went around (laughs) and, and, and looked at businesses and the way I ended up getting hired, I got hired by a payroll company. And here's the story. I'm standing at an empty booth at a job fair and I'm writing in my folio. And this guy at the table looks over at me and he says, what you doing? I said, I'm taking notes on the companies that caught my eye, seeing if I think they'd be interesting. He said, am I on that list? I said, honestly, I didn't see what you do. I didn't, don't think so. He said, well, I'm, I'm a payroll company. And I went payroll. I don't even know what that's about. That doesn't really sound very interesting to me. (laughs) And he says, oh, come on, give me a break. Uh, And he starts getting into it. And this guy was passionate and he was interesting and he was engaging. And he said, give me a shot. You seem like a nice dude. Would you do an interview? 
sure. I'm going to do some others with some other companies too, but yeah, you want to interview me? I'm not going to say no to that. So I went in for an interview and I was sure I was, cause I worked in operations for wall street, right? So I can process payroll. Mm-hmm. Probably it's way simpler math. So I'm assuming I'm going to sit in a cube and process payroll for this guy if they get hired. And about 30 minutes into the interview, I came to the blunt realization that we were not on the same page. And I said, are are we talking about a payroll processor? He says, heck no, you're a sales guy. (laughs) No, I'm not. I started laughing. I said, no, 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 no. If you've ever seen the movie Groundhog's Day, that insurance guy that he punches in the street, that's how I envision sales guys. And I'm never going to be that guy. And he says, well, then Ah. don't be. I sit back in my chair and I'm like, what do you mean don't be? He says, you're a nice guy. If you can understand this product and knowledgeably talk about it with people, with your attitude and your energy, you're going to sell the hell out of it. I'm like, I don't know. He says, how about this? Let me finish the process of interviewing you for a sales job now that you know it's a sales job. If you dis- <laughs> right, he says yeah, now you know if, you, and if you end up feeling like you could do it, I'll give I'll make you a deal. I'll give you six months, and if at the end of the six months, even if you're doing good by my standards, you're not enjoying it, I'll let you go back into training and become a processor. I'm like oh, I got a net, and a job offer with a net in the Great Recession, yeah, and a salary. It's not a commission only pay you know sales job. Okay. Mm-hmm. What the hell? Uh, leaps of faith happen all the time, right? So I did. And I got hired by Payroll One and I, I went through their training, which was fairly minimal. And I got to understand what the product was. And I was given a map and told, go talk to people. So I was ignorance on fire. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I knew the product. Go. I didn't know any sales processes. I didn't understand any of that side of it. I was just a hell of a nice guy. That was my entire plan. Know what I'm talking about? Be a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. Yeah, Back exactly. Back to being younger brother, right? <laughs> I didn't, I, at the time, I hadn't thought about it that way. I just thought if I go in and be nice, like don't be annoying. That was my one rule. Don't be annoying. If they look annoyed, eject. So there were probably times in my early sales Mm -hmm. career where I ejected too early because I thought I was annoying them. But I'd rather have... Uh, Yeah. Probably highly sensitive But at at the same time, I I was very successful with Payroll One and I I had an amazing experience working with them. Uh, and, And the guy who hired me is still a dear friend. Uh, and a couple of years later, he says, hey, I'm leaving. And I said, what? I thought everything was great. He goes, yeah, I'm starting my own company. And in a year, you're going to come work for me. Does that work for you? Because, <laughs> you know, we had to wait out all the non-competes and things. And I so I ended up leaving there about three months later so that I could have a year clear so I could go work for him. And I got hired by the state in the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation um, to do career coaching and help people get hired towards the late part of the Great Recession. This was into 2011 now. So I was working more with disabled individuals who were trying to return to work. Wow. So here's a relationship that starts with Uh, him saying, just give me a uh chance at a fair that then turns into you're willing to leave a job to go work with him Absolutely. in an area that you've never worked in before. Yeah, yeah. that's the power of relationships. And, and it right? was again through him that I ended up where I'm at today because, um, you know, he had me empowered at Altitude to lead and develop the sales program. I've, I, was, uh, I became a member of a community called the Experience Pros. They had a radio show and a networking group. And Altitude, uh, we were very active in it. We had radio advertising. We did great success with it, and it built Altitude up to a very strong local brand. Um, And then one day the opportunity came about, and I went to Andy and said, the radio show kind of wants to hire me, and it really sounds like fun. And he went, I don't blame you. Go have fun. (laughs) 
(laughs) (laughs) (laughs) And that was how I transitioned from payroll to marketing. Um, because it was, again, it, a payroll was fine. I was serving people. I was helping people. I felt good about it. But being with the radio show, I got to meet celebrities. I got to go to places and be their handlers. Like it was a different level of fun. And honestly, that was why I took that leap of faith. I had no idea if it was going to be more profitable or not. I just knew Money hasn't been my motivator for the last few years of this. Why should it start now? That looks like fun and they want to hire me. Let's do it. (laughs) Yeah. So again. Well, how exciting. Yeah. When opportunities present themselves to be open to that, right. And not be tied to. Well, and I'm sure there was money in it, but there was also the fun factor, which was something that maybe you recognize as the value needed Right. Uh, well, and you know, that's where you know, taking a step into marketing was, I think I'm good at marketing, but nothing in my background is marketing related. I haven't done marketing. I haven't trained marketing. I didn't educate marketing. I, I, but I understand from what I've done professionally, how to empathize and think about others. And at its core, that is marketing. So I, uh, Mm-hmm. It, it, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have necessarily seemed like a natural transition, but again, uh, leaps of faith are kind of a theme throughout this because uh, by not making leaps of faith, the dark days were the dark days. I did what I thought I was supposed to. Leaps of faith don't come with, oh yeah, conventional wisdom would say as a payroll guy, you should go into radio marketing and advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, that's your no, next logical no, step, but right? But <laughs> at the same time, it was like, this is something I really think I can do. And I really think I'll enjoy. So yeah, I'll take the leap of faith. And I may fall on my face miserably. And in the end, the radio show did end up failing, not due to anything on our part. We just, our radio broadcaster changed their format to all political talk. And we were a business talk show for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't have a home yeah. anymore and that that yeah that, yeah, that sort of killed thing. things but so how, uh, a friend of mine called that? me and said i'm trying to sell my payroll company and i need you to help me so will you come work for me for a year bump up the multiplier and i'll get you a, a, a piece on the back end and he did so, <laughs> so i went and helped him out while i figured out what i was doing next yeah. I mean, again, ah. I, I think payroll services that act right and, and serve their customers well are one of the easiest things to sell in the world because it's a morally just straight and narrow. Pay your people, pay your taxes, don't mismanage mm-hmm. my money, make sure everything's handled so the IRS doesn't call me. And if they do, you're not doing your job. So for me, morally, that was always an easy thing to sell because I know I'm doing right by people. And at that point, it became, okay, now that I honored my obligation of staying for a year with you guys and helping with this transition, I want to go back to marketing because it's more fun and I am good at it. Mm -hmm. Is that how you found plum marketing then? Or I guess how how did that? Actually, one of my mentors, a a person named Shara Hubert, who I've known for about eight years, through different networks and and golfing together and martinis on the regular. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely. That's a good mentor. Well, I I was the new company that came in after the other company sold. I had to stay with them for a year. And I, yeah, that was part of the deal. So I did my, I helped my friends sell the company and then I had to stay in there for a year to help as the continuing sales rep. Yeah, because when you're the sales engine or part of the exactly. sales engine, that's so what that's behind. why I had a one year obligation with some golden handcuffs at the end of it. And in that time, we hired three people so that I more than replaced myself. So everything was fine yeah. on my exit, but I sat down with with my mentor Shara and said, "Hey, Shara, I'm I'm kind of done with payroll. It's not as fun as it was the last time, and I think I'm done for good. But I got to figure out what's next. So, what are your thoughts? Where should I look?" And she said, you shouldn't look. We're hiring. Come work for me. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I went, yeah, you know, that wasn't the point of this, right? I wasn't like fishing. She's like, no, no, you weren't fishing. And I know it because you had no idea we were even thinking about this. But yes, we're hiring. It's time. Come work for me finally. <laughs> well, I just love how your story has kind of changed from in the beginning. I don't know what I'm going to do. How can I get a job to now? All these people are off. Yeah. Things. When I, when the, Wow. When the Experience big, Pros Radio Show ended, it was pretty abrupt. It was, we found out on a Tuesday that our last show would be Friday. And so, right. Yeah, the, the radio yeah, station tells really you that. Short. And so we put out on social media, hey, we've been told that our show is ending Friday. We're going to do a week of cool stuff to say goodbye to all of our listeners. And we're going to do a cool show Friday as a goodbye. So, of course, you're publicizing and marketing it. And then on top yeah. of that, I start getting calls from all these people on our network, including one of our biggest competitors, Team Dave Logan. Hey, you want to come interview with us? <laughs> so, yeah. Ah, right. So, yeah, nice it was a great wanted. experience to, to have built my network and built this community. And upon just simply announcing that it was ending – job opportunities were coming at me right and left. I didn't apply for a single thing the last two times I've been unemployed. I just had my network mm -hmm. come to me and say, you know, as soon as I put it out there that I was unemployed in some way, people came to me and said, well, we know what you were good at. Come do it for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had a track record. Well, I was going to ask if um, why you weren't thinking of going back into radio uh, when you were saying that, you know, you asked your mentor, what should I do? Because uh, it seemed like that was such a passion well, and a love for you. You know, years ago, I started a little bit into radio because a dear friend of mine growing up, somebody I still keep in close touch with and think the world of, is a local sports radio host. Uh, he and I did fantasy football in the back of our 12th grade business law class in the back of the sports page on paper. <laughs> um, so he and I go way back and uh, he was the, the pro uh, the, the production manager of a show in the early two thousands. And sometimes the two old hosts would go on tangents and he'd call me and say, Adam, get on the air, talk Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd ask Bronco questions to get him back on track. And one of the things that that guy has told me for years is if you love something like sports talk, don't do it professionally, just be a caller. And so there is a certain amount oh. of understanding that I gained from that because the media companies and the politics and the games on the inside are, are, are the parts that, that don't allow for the passion of just talking to people just learning interesting stories about interesting businesses because the mm -hmm. freedom you need to really truly do that is, is hard to find. Uh, I mean, we were, we were getting advertisers who, when we do the research on, cause we had a vetting process to be an experienced pros member and you had to have a certain ratio of positive to negative reviews. If you had negative reviews at all, and we'd get these people with whose mm -hmm. ratios were off and we'd do their vetting and we'd be like, we can't endorse these guys. And the radio pro the, the station would be like, well, they paid. So they get to be on your show. Only endorsed companies get to be on our show. Oh, so that's a problem. So it's, yeah, it's oh, stuff like yeah. that where the politics yeah. of behind the scenes ruin what the, Cinderella of it is. So I like marketing. That's the part I really enjoy because it's the, it's the empathetic, you know, it's flexing that empathetic muscle and thinking about how others want to be served. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're working for um, a company that's, it sounds like it's, number one, you're working for a friend, but it's also straightforward in terms of their straight up, good people and it's you can be proud to be doing it doing the work and well, absolutely you, you know it's it's great because my my manager is somebody i consider a friend outside of work but at the same time the owners of the company um i had met them as prospects and sold them on some payroll services um that they still use and so when uh when they met to interview me 
Um, you know, there was a familiarity, but we were able to go, go in a deeper direction to understand each other as well. So, um, it just has created the ability to trust them that their integrity and my integrity is really aligned. Um, and that exactly, I, I so important have to know that at this point with what some of the wounds that the dark ages left on me. I have to know that our integrity aligns and that I'm not going to wake up one morning and find that you've done something that I have to answer for. I'm not doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say again, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, with, as they say, yes. right, with, with age comes wisdom. You've been through that and uh, you've been through it in such a way that it has really left an impression on what not to do in the future. So Adam, I gotta tell you, I could, um, I got a, a whole handful more questions to ask you. So maybe we'll have to schedule uh, your, your interview for a part two, but um, let's start to wrap up here. And if you would talk about what you think has served you the best through your career. So when you think about someone who's just starting out uh, or to, in transition or stuck, what has served you that you think would be meaningful for them to, I think there's to take two away things. from this? I think knowing the morals and values that you stand for and not tolerating those things that you should not. Um, Far too often we think that we have to do this or that in a career. And there's morals behind it so often when you take a step back and look at it. You're, You're compromising yourself. And that is absolutely unnecessary. There's another job. There's another employer. Let the bad actors fail. If nobody will work for them, they won't stay in business very long. So if you know you are standing on your morals, step back, walk away, go find something else. You are absolutely worth it. Wow. Yeah, that's that's spot on because the toll that it takes emotionally is. uh, It's psychological warfare that causes PTSD. Uh, In my personal experience, I had it. And, and the second piece I would say is uh, the, the leaps of faith, the ability to not follow because you're supposed to, this is the career path, this is uh, trust your gut, pray on it, whatever it is that you do in your own way to find that, that inner voice. But, um, you know, take those leaps of faith, do things that are risky and uncomfortable, seek joy, because if you work your life away you know, there's a there's a punk rock song by a guy named Frank Turner, and he says in there, I've never understood like live uh, working 50 years away at something that you hate. I I just I, I don't either. Mm. I refuse that life. And and there are better ways. I see people who feel trapped. And when they start to get free, they realize that their employer had made them their own jailer. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I see you're, you're living both of those things. So not only in that, that's why I purposefully don't ask, well, what advice would you give someone? (laughs) Because it's easy to give advice. It's different to say lessons learned or what served me. So thank you for sharing those pieces. And I do think there was a, such a switch that flipped for you, right? When you decompressed for those four months and you really looked at what do I want to be doing? What am I good at? What makes me happy versus what jobs are out there? What should I be doing? What's next? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If we have uh, another opportunity to chat sometime, I actually can tell you the exact moment that the light switch switched in me. And I knew I could not go back to my job. There was, it was that visceral of a moment. Wow. Yeah. Well, we'll leave that as a teaser for next time. How's that? (laughs) Um, anything else uh, that you would add? Well, the only other thing is uh, you mentioned quotes. Um, that uh, Absolutely. If those yeah. folks listening have not already acquainted themselves with John Wooden, uh, he was the, the Wizard of Westwood, the head coach of UCLA basketball, and one of the greatest uh, motivators of all time. One of my favorite quotes from him is, if you're not making mistakes, then you're not doing anything. I'm positive that doers make mistakes. Mm. so 
if you're not nervous about the choices you're making, you're probably playing it too safe. Well, thank you. I think uh, that's a great quote to end on. So, uh, Adam, thank you so much for sharing your story and being so open and candid about what was working and what's not and how you've taken back your your power, so to speak, with uh, being I'm, joyful and finding. I'm glad to you. share. Hope uh, hope it helps at least one person out there feel the power that they can uh, move in the direction that makes them happy, not just because they feel like they have to. Well, that is the point of the podcast. So I do hope that uh, listeners, if if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe below. Uh, if you have any questions for me or for Adam, uh, please note that on my blog page on my website where this uh, interview will be posted and I'll make sure to get them to Adam and get you an answer. So uh, on that note, I hope you have a great day, Adam and listeners. Um, Thank have you. A great day Take and care. A great week. Thank you.